So I'm going to be looking at some common questions that get sent through to Lotus Negong or to me, um, really, because you get lots of questions coming in. We get, we get hundreds, really. Uh, but sometimes you see patterns. There's certain questions that come up time and time again. Uh, and I did this before in some Q&As, maybe a year or two ago. Uh, so now I'll try and uh, look at some more of the common questions we get. So I've got some of them here uh, on my phone. So excuse me for looking at my phone while I'm filming. I don't want to be unprofessional, but I haven't memorized the questions. So the first one is, uh, okay, so commonly, should I be vegetarian for the internal arts? Well, that one comes up a lot. Food is a big deal um, for a lot of people. And vegetarianism or veganism um, are very much ingrained or sort of intertwined in with the spiritual arts. And a lot of people are vegetarian for ethical reasons um, because they don't want to be involved in the death of a living creature. Um, and I understand that from an ethical standpoint. Um, but the, the question was actually, should I be vegetarian for the internal arts? I think that that really varies depending upon what you want from the arts. So I, I often tell people in my school, if they're vegetarian, that if you are vegetarian for ethics or morals, then you should sustain your, um, your dietary habits, of course, um, if that's something that's very, very important to you, because to compromise your ethics or morals is always a, um, a well, it's not something you should do. Um, but if you are vegetarian for health purposes um, with regards to the internal arts practice, then probably you should relook a little bit again um, because it is possible to be healthy being a vegetarian, of course, like definitely, um, but it is much easier to be healthy if you're not a vegetarian. So, and what happens when a lot of people come into these arts uh, is a vegetarian because they like the idea of it or they've been told that they should be by their spiritual uh, gurus or masters or whatever. Um, and in actual fact, uh, they're not actually that healthy because they don't maintain the diet uh, very well. Often uh, within Chinese medicine, people that are vegetarian tend to be blood deficient. Um, it's the way we understand the, the sort of nature of the health and that can be a little bit problematic for the arts. But if we ignore all of that for a second and literally just look at what happens within the internal arts, ignoring the ethics or anything like that, basically, um, if you look at a lot of meats, very simply, not Chinese medicine theory, this is Qigong theory, uh, a lot of meats are very dense, very heavy, and they produce a lot of energy uh, within the body. Um, so they, they are for people who are trying to build qi or to uh, build power, if you like, in the internal martial arts, or to fill the body with energy, then meat is very, very uh, good. It's a very quick and easy way to do so, to produce um, this energy within the body. For people who are trying to clean or refine their energy or to touch those more sort of, um, more refined, the more spiritual side of the practice, then actually can be easier to do um, on a vegetarian diet with a lot of uh, light, green, leafy uh, type foods. So I, I'm sort of in the middle because I tend to get caught up in these two camps because I know a lot of people that are really adamant, um, especially within meditation circles and Buddhist circles and things and Hindu circles, you should be vegetarian. And then I know a lot of people, especially within the Tai Chi world um, or Qigong world, they're like, no, you should never be vegetarian, especially ones who are interested in Chinese medicine and who eat meat. Now, to me, I think there should be a certain degree of flexibility within a person's diet, and I will adjust a little bit according to what I'm doing. So at certain periods of time when I'm trying to build energy or um, sustain my health or my vigor or to develop my art, then I will have meat within my diet. Um, and actually, my diet at the moment is quite meat heavy. But if I am going to try to refine spirit, so maybe I'm working on a meditation retreat, um, or I'm going into a period where I'm going to be exploring consciousness, I want to be working on the level of Shen, or, or that kind of stage, you know, more, more towards the ethereal consciousness-based side of things, um, then actually a vegetarian diet can be much more useful, uh, can be very helpful. Um, the, the nature of it, I take the dense heavy meats out, uh, then the digestive system can relax for a start. Um, it's a lot easier to quiet in the mind and there is a cleanness to the energy and you can even feel it after a while you're just cleaner in your body but the problem is that if you are living on that diet all of the time but you're doing energy work that's trying to build you can actually end up quite up unrooted um, so the energy can rise a little bit too much and there's not enough an anchor to the body the body can also grow weak and a little bit depleted so you see a lot of people that are vegetarian all of the time uh, within the internal arts especially within arts like Neigong or qigong um, can end up pretty depleted. Their energy can get really, really low. It doesn't mean there isn't ways they can get around it. Of course there are. There are, you know, you can just 
uh, be very, very uh, focused on eating certain types of food. You know, you might have to sort of dump a load of beetroot into your diet or something, or adjust whatever you need to do to, to maintain your health. But it's probably never going to be as robust as somebody who eats meat, to be perfectly honest. Now, the problem with answering that question, though, uh, is that it's so loaded with layers of attachments that you can't, you can't really give an answer without someone getting upset. Because obviously, if somebody is under the belief system that uh, there's a lot of karma attached to the eating of um, dead animals, ultimately animals have been killed for your food, um, then obviously that's going to be such a major component to them that, that they're going to get very upset if you say, no, don't have to be vegetarian. And if someone is very uh, robustly into building lots of energy for Tai Chi or power for the body or something, they're going to be very anti-vegetarianism. Uh, but, but I think that the extremes of those two camps are the problems. And to me, if you don't have um, a strict dietary belief system that you adhere to, uh, then I think adjusting between those two states is always, is always wise. So I encourage my students who are not vegetarian by nature or vegetarian for ethics to eat meat in their diet, a good balance of it, not too much, you know, a good balance of, of healthy meat in their diet uh, to maintain this sort of density within the body and this robustness um, and to build energy and to build blood. Um, but then when we enter into longer meditation retreats or courses, then I will advise them to switch to a vegetarian diet for a period of time prior to the practice, uh, just to let the sort of digestive system rest. And I've had problem, people have problems with that, thinking that's contradictory or um, something like this, but not really. Like, I don't understand why it's not okay to fluidly shift between states. I think that's fine. I don't see a problem with that. It's like, um, you know, just because I say you need meat for certain aspects of health or, or it's easier with certain aspects to help you have meat, that doesn't mean you can't go with meat without meat for like a few weeks or a few months or something. You, it's okay, you know, your, your body will still have that robustness and that's why this change in between them is a good idea. So ultimately, I think my take on vegetarianism versus not being vegetarian is be fluid, be flexible with it, depending on what is wise at the stage in your training. And as long as you... Um, maintain that and adjust your diet according to what you need, um, then you'll be fine. But the caveat to that is if you are a vegetarian for ethical purposes because you believe the karmic attachment uh, to eating meat is bad for you, then of course uh, stay with that. You should never compromise your morals um, for someone else, even if your health suffers. I mean, even if your health suffers. If your morals are more important to you than your health, uh, then remain vegetarian. Like, that's not even a uh, that's not even a question for me. Our next question uh, is, what role does intent play in the arts? Okay, so intent, your intention. Uh, how, does that in, how does that change the arts? It depends what art you're talking about, really. Uh, I mean, I would imagine uh, that most of the questions people are asking really are either going to be about Qigong or Tai Chi. So maybe we'll look at those. So first of all, intention. Uh, we need to understand, for me, with regards to intention, that it's a, it's a major component in the arts. Um, but there's two things we shouldn't be using. One of these is imagination or visualization. I mean, that's not a way we should be using uh, our intent within these arts. I, I never think that is a good idea. Um, and the second one uh, is intent is not, like sometimes I see in Tai Chi especially, people trying to direct qi out towards the hand. So they do a push posture and something, and then they sort of send qi out through there. And that's never a good idea either. That's the wrong way to use the intent. If the intent is used this way, by the way, to drive or direct energy in a straight line out of the hands or something, it actually depletes you. It drains the body. Um, because what happens is because of the intent being placed in the distance and the pushing, gradually over time, the body gets confused and it thinks that you know, it thinks that it's applying pressure to something, so your nervous system kicks in and the kidneys kick in, all that power kicks in, and it actually burns you out after a little while. The other thing that happens is if you're imagining opponents, you get that people doing rollback and they're imagining arm locking someone, they're imagining pressing someone or whatever they're doing. Um, if you start imagining that, that can actually hardwire tension into the nervous system and fight or flight into the body as well. Uh, so the body will tighten and the mind will tighten. Because intent is really powerful, which ultimately is the the main answer to the question. <laughs> There's a saying that where the yi goes, the qi goes, or the yi leads the qi, and it's not quite right when people translate it that way. Um, actually, more accurately, it should be the quality of the yi guides the qi, not the action of the yi. So it's not that I use, yi is the intention, right? So it's not like I use my intention to guide the qi out. 
It's the quality of my yi that dictates the qi. So what do they mean by that? So in Tai Chi, for example, we have two uh, key phrases, two key qualities. One is called song, which means release. Uh, sometimes people say relax, but it means release, really, to let go or to release, to spread the qi, basically. And the second one is ting, which is listening, but actually means absorption of the mind into the object of the body or the object of the opponent if you're pushing hands or something like this. Now, these two things, song and ting, like to release and to listen or to absorb into, are qualities that are applied ultimately to the intention. So if the intention is released and the intention is stable and listening to the process that's going on, then the intent is being used in the right way. And the result of the intent having those qualities is that the chi will do what it needs to do. The energy will, the chi will, the energy will move as it is required for that art. So it is not the action of the yi that leads the chi, it is the quality of the yi, it's the quality of your intent um, that's most important. This also applies to uh, cultivation practices as well, um, especially within the Taoist tradition, uh, Buddhist as well, I suppose, but the Taoist tradition certainly. So there's a whole argument um, that you shouldn't have too much theory within these arts. And you'll see this for people saying, oh, you just do Qigong and no theory, don't bother, like, not too many words, don't explore things too much. And it's kind of a misunderstanding of something that was said in the Tao Te Ching. But what they don't understand is that the theory it's not just mental clutter. The theory is actually the thing that shapes your intent. And this is what is really vital for the arts. So what happens is if I study Taoism and I study Qigong and I'm thinking, okay, I want my Qi to build and to move in the right way and I want it to, I want it to lead to some kind of mental comfort and emotional settling and centeredness of spirit. You know, I want, I want, to be, I want my Qi to work for me, you know, to do all these things. Then... The way they do it within Taoism is pretty clever. I think within most traditions, actually, Hinduism and Buddhism are the same. Within a tradition, what they do is they have a whole library of teachings. So within Taoism, for example, what I might study is the nature of the cosmos and feng shui and Chinese medicine. I might study the nature of energetics within the center of the body. And then I have my ethical teachings, and I have my moral teachings, uh, then I have the philosophy. You know, so it's big, right? I study all these things, the I Ching, like the classic change. I study all these things, this whole um, system that ultimately is a lifestyle system. It's a system that teaches you all about life. It teaches you about their view of the cosmos and, and of the earth and of the human body and our relationship between these things. Now, what people don't realize when they say, oh, it's just mental clutter. It's not mental clutter. That is the stuff that changes your intent. That is the stuff that changes the quality of the yi. Because what happens is, your life learnings, the lessons you've learned, the things you are told, ultimately shape your mind. So if I've been brought up in a very um, aggressive way and all I've encountered is aggression, that will shape my intent in a certain way. Obviously, people would know that. If I've been brought up in a very loving way, that will shape my intent in that way. If I have been brought up in a very scientific world where everything is very much, um, you know, what I can see, what I can touch and feel, this will shape your intent. And that's where many of us are brought up these days. If you're brought up Oh, and you'll, you'll learn and you study and you fill your mind with a, a wisdom tradition, an Eastern tradition, then what happens is your intent starts to view life in that way. Now, sometimes what people don't realize, and I guess I can see why, because it does seem a bit abstract, but the changing of your understanding of life changes the nature of your intent, which then changes the way that the chi moves within the body. Those teachings are there to change the intent. So um, I call this shaping the yi. And Taoism does it through the study of the cosmos and the environment and the human body. That's ultimately what it is. It's like the human body is, is all about how does it relate to the outside, the microcosmic, macrocosmic relationship. That's really what Taoism is studying. You know? Buddhism does it through Dharma, through a study of you know, everything, everything from its precepts and its, um, its path and, and, uh, uh, and all of these things and the teachings of uh, Buddha and Sila and all this, all of these things that they are using. So they are studying um, really the nature of mind and, and morality. Uh, Hinduism does it often through its studyings of, you know, Ayurvedic medicine, as well as uh, the Hindu stories, the Vedic teachings and things like this. They each have their own system, their own flavor, the traditions. But they all have a vast pantheon of writings and information. And what these things do is they shape the intent. 
And, the, and I sometimes see, or shape the yi within Chinese, I sometimes see people who are very good at these arts uh, sometimes not realize this. Um, and I think that's a little bit of an oversight because they themselves have studied all of the classics. They themselves have been taught all of these life sciences. So I, I know a couple of Taoist teachers, for example, I can think of, who've been through study of the I Ching, the I Ching, they study feng shui, study Chinese medicine, study cosmology, they understand all of this. Um, and then they tell their students, um, and they're very good at Qigong, you know, and they tell their students, oh, you don't need all of that stuff. You don't need that stuff. And then consequently, what happens is a student never gets as good as they do, and they can't understand why. Um, and I think they think it's because they're just not working hard enough or the student's not, not doing the right thing. It's not, it's because they don't have the right intent. The quality of their mind has not been changed by the teaching, so therefore the practice won't unfold within them in the right way. Um, and I think that people sometimes don't realize that because everything has to be like very linear. So if there's a not direct cause and effect relationship from one thing unfolding to another thing, they can't see it. So the idea that to change the way that you perceive life or to perceive ethics or to perceive relationships to others or whatever would change your intent seems quite strange to them. But to me, it seems really obvious. So if I were to look at qualities that would make the intent work for the internal arts, first of these would be the same as Tai Chi, song, release, like not hanging on to things, letting stuff spread and relax. Second one, listening or absorption, because listening, ting, ulti means the absorption of the mind into an object, whether the object is the body or somebody else, it doesn't matter. Yeah? And the third one, uh, ultimately, would be the, the tradition itself, would be the other quality that changes the intent. Now, if those things are in place, uh, then the qi will move in the right way. And in that way, the intent is absolutely vital to the arts. It is the be-all and end-all uh, to success within these traditions. But people don't understand that the intent does not mean to push and push and push and I'm going to burn and aim for that goal and, and I must move the chi over here and imagine the chi doing this. It's not that. It's the quality of your mind uh, that makes a difference, not the action of it. So our next question is, uh, how important is the kwa in Tai Chi and Qigong? Okay, how important is the kwa? Uh, very, is the answer. <laughs> so the kwa, if you don't know what the kwa is, essentially it's the area on the inside of your hip. Some people call it the... Um, inguinal crease, or they identify it as this, and some people try to actually identify the muscles in it, uh, what's involved. But it, to me, it's really simple. If you were to wear a bikini, uh, where the elastic runs along the inside of your hip joints, that's the quad. So I sometimes call the quad the bikini line. That, it's that area of your body. I know maybe that's um, not giving it the mystical uh, whatever it deserves, but to me the quad is the bikini line. So, how important is it to Tai Chi and Qigong? It's vital. It's really, really important. I mean, basically, with regards to folding the body, to go up and down, uh, to essentially use this region where the hips sit, you have two choices. You either have the choice of moving the outside of the body, the hips, yeah, uh, as you would naturally do when you fold, or you have the option of using the qua on the inside. And either one, so the inside or the outside, the qua or the hips, can be the dominant thing that controls your rising and sinking or moving in Tai Chi and Qigong. The, now, essentially, um, both of them cause the body to function in slightly different ways. And, and a lot of people that I've met who I try to teach, especially in Qigong, are falling down a little bit because they don't know how to use their kwa. And, and there's lots of people in Qigong, Jam Jong, practicing that they just don't use their kwa properly. They think they do, but they're not. They're using their hips. Now, the hips, essentially, what I also mean is like the muscles on the outside of the hips and the outside of your thigh. That, and essentially, all of this region of the body that if I go up and down naturally, I squat and, and up and down, what will happen is you'll just fold from the hips, right? Like if you're you know, lowering yourself to the floor. Now the hips are designed to hold you up, um, which might sound strange to some, but think of it like this. If you're standing and you're gonna drop into a squat or slowly lower yourself into a squat, um, you know, until your butt's very close to the floor, uh, you need something to hold you up to stop you falling over. Um, and essentially the muscles on the outside and the hips and the lower back are those things that hold you up, right? And as soon as I lower myself down uh, using the hip joints, then that's what will happen is my body will support itself up so I don't collapse. The qua is a little different um, because when I go down into the qua, actually it doesn't support the body in quite the same way. So if you wanted to see when you use the qua and when you use the hips, whenever you squat towards the floor, you tend to use your hips, or what I call the hips and the line on the outside of the body, right? 
Whenever you sit down in a chair, you use your qua generally. And sometimes I've told this to people, or said this to people, and they've looked at me like I'm a bit strange. But try it. Like, try squatting down to the ground several times and like palpate yourself and see which muscles are being used. Now relax down into a chair, like sit into it slowly and see which muscles are being used. It's a different set of muscles. Um, and those different sets of muscles are being used because obviously it's a slightly different shape and different aim. When you're squatting to the floor, the body knows that you don't want to fall over, so it holds you up. When you're sitting into a chair, it knows that eventually, not too long, it doesn't have to hold you quite so much because you're going to be relaxing onto something, so therefore it doesn't need to do that. So you have these two um, different actions. Also, when you sit into a chair, your pelvis goes back out, right, because your butt's going back. So that, that means you tend to use your choir as well. Now, if you want to practice qigong and you want to use the body properly you actually use the same muscles that you use when you sit not when you squat um, and a lot of people are making that mistake within their practice so you sit into qigong not squat so meaning that you use the inside not the outside you use the qua not the not the hip joints and almost every beginner if i'm honest or every practitioner who's come in from somewhere else the vast majority of them, if I were to be blunt, I would say they're using their hips, especially when they sit. They, they squat down into their stance. So I always tell people, sit, sit, sit. Now, the first thing they do when they sit is their butt sticks out, right? Because, of course, they're sitting back and they're not using the hips to support the pelvis. So the butt goes out. That's incorrect, obviously. So then the next principle that we have is to drop the tailbone so that the lower back lengthens. And what that means is even though you're sat into the choir, the pelvis will adjust properly um, so that you're in the right position. If you if you sit into the hips and you relax your tailbone, the pelvis won't move. If you sit into the choir and you relax your tailbone, the pelvis will move because the hip muscles, the muscles running out of the hips, are not holding the pelvis in place. And that's really vital. That's um, really, really important for people to understand, you know, that the pelvis is free of you using your choir. Now, it, on the inside of your body, if you're using your hips, weirdly, it I don't know why exactly, but it's like the inside of your body is supported upwards as well. So when I try to empty the chest, and to, you know, a common principle in Tai Chi and Qigong, to drop the mass from the chest to the abdomen, if I'm using my hips, actually you can't drop your mass. It, it stays in the chest. It doesn't matter if you round the chest or you collapse the sternum or you sink the tent or whatever you do, the center will not drop down. It doesn't make any difference. The chi will not move from the chest to the abdomen. The center will not move down. It's because it's supported from underneath. If I sit into my choir, it's like something is just popped out inside your torso. The supports are taken out. So if I sit into the choir, when I release the chest and release the sternum, uh, then the center actually drops from the chest to the abdominal cavity. So your weight goes down and the chi actually goes from the chest um, down, to the, down to the abdominal space, which is kind of what you need to get the Dantian going, right? That's a lot of the basis of the Dantian and Qigong work. So if you don't use your choir, um, you can't empty the chest. So if you don't use your choir, you can't sink your mass. If you use your hips, let's put this another way, if you use your hip joints to fold or to squat, um, then you can't, you can't empty the chest. If you use your hips, you can't sink the chi, you can't sink your mass. So considering those are really important principles in Tai Chi and Qigong, the answer to the question is the choir is absolutely vital. Um, for Qigong and Tai Chi practice to work. And, and normally with regards to the choir, you need um, an experienced teacher to get their hands on and show you how to, how to move that joint. It's funny that if you, uh, <laughs> if you watch people as they age as well, just as a side, like people get the choir and the hips mixed up. So the example I, I gave you to sit in a chair and feel which muscles are being used, ultimately that's the choir. That only applies actually if you're using your body healthily. Um, so what I mean by that is if you uh, take someone who has not used their choir for years and years and years, when they sit in an armchair, you'll know because they'll go, Ugh, and they'll grunt as they sit down. Then when they stand up, Ugh, they make that noise. And I'm sure um, you either know people who do or you've caught yourself doing it. You know, the, the old age noise as you get in and out of the chair that the younger people don't do. Um, and essentially part of that is because they're using too much effort to go in and out of the chair. Because after years and years of using the hips and the lower back, essentially, when they sit into the chair, they're still using their hips and they're still using the lower back, so the choir is pretty much switched off. So they're using the muscles that you would use to squat all the way to the ground to support you to sit into the chair, which is way more work than it needs to be, because it means you're fighting gravity on the way into the chair. As soon as you start using your choir efficiently, uh, you'll know because that 
um, especially if you're a bit older, you'll know, as an odd sign, because if you come in and out of the chair using your choir, you'll find it's not hard work anymore. The, the old age grunt uh, will disappear and your grandkids will uh, stop teasing you. So the choir, the bikini line on the inside of the hips is vitally important. The hips must be swatch, switched off and the choir must be used. In fact, hips um, are something of a banned word in my class. I'll never tell anyone to use their hips in Tai Chi. I never tell anyone to use their hips in Qigong. They're words that you just don't use. It's almost like they're swear words, you know, um, hips. Instead, it's always qua, qua, qua. And I do lots and lots of work with people to understand how to operate and move from the qua. So yeah, the qua are really important. So the next question then is, uh, how many hours per day should I practice? Okay, well this question gets asked uh, in many different ways. You know, am I doing enough? How much do I need to achieve this? And da, da, da. How, but basically it all comes down to this. How many hours a day uh, should I practice? I'm going to answer with regards to Qigong, and Neigong especially, um, but I think the same applies to the internal arts. So, first of all, uh, how many hours? Well, the obvious answer is depends what you want out of the practice. I mean, that's true. If you're a casual practitioner, should we say, who wants a bit of relaxation, a bit of fun, a bit of interest, uh, not much, you know, just do 20 minutes to half hour a day, to be perfectly honest, because um, you'll get most of your tuition in the class you go to. If you really want the most out of the arts, that's a little different. Maybe, maybe I should answer the rest of the question assuming you want the most out of the arts, meaning mastery or something like that out of Qigong. How many hours should you practice? I think you should practice less than some teachers say, um, because some teachers will say as much as you can, 24 hours a day, constant practice, you know, just da -da -da -da, hammer it out. And very much that's the Chinese attitude traditionally as well. Do as much as you can, do as much as you can. I don't think so. I think that there is an optimum amount, optimum amount the body can do. Um, and for most people, the maximum seems to be around four hours. Um, and that's why I tell people that I teach uh, that that's probably enough practice, about four hours. So even you, if you do like a day-long seminar and you're doing six hours, eight hours, that's a little bit too much really. Um, but it's not a perfect world and you've got a certain amount of information to get across to people. But for yourself, if you're a really dedicated practitioner and what I would consider almost like a full-time practitioner, four hours is enough. If you want more hours, and I'll explain why in a minute, if you want more hours per day, then it's okay to do, but you should probably be practicing uh, theory, study of theory, uh, reading classics or I Ching or uh, Chinese medicine or um, maybe some more sitting practice, just working on the breath or something like that. But the four hours max, I'm talking about your sort of intense energy work. You're building the Dantian or opening the channels or developing your Tai Chi form or something like this. Now, the reason I, I set it at four hours, and of course that varies, some will be five, some will be three, but you know, around there, is that's about how much your body can do before you start breaking it down from what I see internally. So some training builds you up, some training breaks you down. Yeah. Um, and there's arguments for both. Both have their place, you know, especially with external work, uh, building muscles, this is breaking down work, like breaking down the tissue so they rebuild, you know, or something like this. With regards to qi, there is essentially you're trying to build energy within the body or build the function of the body. Um, and you can think of your practice hours as almost like a little graph that dips after a little while. Um, and what happens is I see people that start going past that sort of four hour sweep spot in their practice, because I get lots of students that want to do six hours a day, seven hours a day, just pushing, pushing, pushing is the body can't sustain it. So the chi can't sustain it, definitely not. Um, and the soft tissues of the body, the connective tissues can't sustain it either. So they start, to, they start to sort of switch off. And what happens is after a while, it's like your body, your internal body goes, oh, that's enough. That's enough qi gang. That's enough soft tissue development. So they'll switch off and then the muscles will switch on instead. It's like they have to, they get replaced. And you see people sort of building internally and then you know they're training too much and then they go past that amount and then what happens is it starts to become external and actually the body starts to tighten up um, and then it starts to break down as well um, because it's very, very difficult for the body to sustain that prolonged training. Um, so I think that kind of amount is, is good. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't do certain times of your life when you do more um, because I think you should because sometimes you should push yourself, especially if you're young, you're healthy, um, vibrant. But to me, that's what retreats are for, you know. But I don't think a normal person should live in retreat unless you're a recluse. Uh, I think that 
you do periods of your life where you study hard, but then your general uh, maintenance of training wants to be about three uh, to four hours a day if you're training efficiently. Now, I'm aware that some teachers will disagree with what I say because they want to say more, more, more. Um, but again, it depends what you want. If you really want to build your chi, say we're taking that principle to build more energy in the body, build more vibrancy. Well, ultimately, when does that energy build? Does it build through the practice? No. The practice changes the efficiency of your body's functioning. The practice changes the efficiency of your breathing. The practice changes the efficiency of your mind. Various things like this. But the actual chi building takes place when you're asleep, when you're at rest. Just like when you're, you know, your, your muscles build, they grow when you're asleep, your body grows when you're asleep. If you, you need that rest in order for the body to grow, your energetic system is the same, your chi is the same. The rest periods are when the chi builds. Now that doesn't mean you'll build loads of chi just by sleeping and resting, of course not. You have to have some causes in place for the effects to arise. The causes are the practices. So the practices make the body function better, the breathing function better, the mind function better. But then the effects of this, the energy will arise during your rest periods. So if you are breaking down the body during your training by doing too much, you know, just tired and pushing and pushing, what happens is then when you rest, you don't build chi because your body is using the rest periods to replace the damage you've done by breaking the body down, if you know what I mean. So if I do eight hours training and I'm really exhausted, I go to sleep, my sleep is putting back the energy I needed just to get to that baseline, you know, to repair the exhaustion. But if I get the amount just right, where the chi is building, 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 and then I rest, I've not broken anything down in the body. There's nothing to replace, there's nothing to repair. So now what happens is the efficient system I've built in my practice means that while I'm asleep, more chi will be built. And that's how you grow. And I've seen lots of people fail in this. I've seen people not progress because they've not done enough. Okay, that's a given, that's so obvious, it's probably not even worth me saying. But then I've also seen people that are held back or fail because they do too much. They just keep pushing their body, pushing their body. Um, and yeah, I mean, at best case scenario, they just don't build enough chi because they're not resting enough. And worst case scenario, they can actually burn the, the body out. So I reckon for majority of time, if you're not in a retreat, that's kind of the maximum we want to train. The minimum, to really succeed in the internal arts or to develop in the right way, it's realistically a couple of hours a day, to be perfectly honest. Anything less than that isn't going to enable you to relax, um, which is major. You know, don't, don't ever underestimate that. Relax your mind, relax your body. But it's not really going to develop the sort of complex or intricate internal mechanisms of something like Nigong on less than a couple of hours a day practice, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, so, yeah, I would say that for amounts. But... There'll come a time when you'll know, you know, you know, you, you can feel, maybe not beginners, beginners can't, but once after a while you know, you, you know when you're building, you know when you're building and you know when you're breaking down. Um, and you can ascertain that and use that to tell you when you should be training. If you're getting a bit older, obviously the time before your body breaks down is going to be um, a bit quicker, a bit shorter, and uh, certain training methods are going to break you down more than others. So I still do external training, uh, punching and kicking and things like this and from martial arts. Those kind of things tend to break you down, um, break down the muscles, break down the tissues. Um, so I'm aware of that, so I keep an eye on that balance. But then most of the stuff I do is internal work, which is building. And I'm very aware of where that perfect point is, or pretty close, you know, before it starts to go over the top of the graph and then you start breaking the body down. That's what you're looking for in your practice because ultimately you want to just grow, grow, grow uh, through your training. So I reckon about that amount uh, for the internal arts uh, is enough.